Who let the dogs out? Ooh, 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 ooh. Welcome to the Mickey and Woody show with me, Paul Wood, and my little mate, Mickey Ayum, still the tightest man in rugby league. In association with Get a Tax Rebate, 1895 Sports, Mesa Vienna Aesthetics, CDX Security. Okay, welcome to the Mickey and Woody show, episode 11, with my little mate, Mick. How are we doing, Mickey? All right, what are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. We've had... uh, had a good, good busy week this week. So. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you've had a busy week. I've been seeing a couple of your um, your Instagram videos. You, what, it, what, what is it you call it? Just fighting with fighting with dogs. Have you, have you, it's um, yeah. Obviously, is it dog training? Is it how it's called? Yeah, well, just so I don't sound like a, a bit of a, a nod the ball. Uh, the no, ball. no, no, no. You're not that, are you? <laughs> yeah, but you know, I've I've got into my dog training now, so uh, I've started doing a lot of lot of this dog training with with, with my new dog. So uh, I've just been practicing a few tricks in that in house. So she she's dead good. She's <laughs> she's, uh, she's called uh, Minton, but she she keeps she keeps eating my shuttlecocks. Right. So I have to tell her I said bad Minton. She's so <laughs> <laughs> so she's she's such a naughty girl. But uh, how's your week been, Ari? Yeah, again, I keep saying like waiting for the, the green light for the gym to reopen. But you know, we finally I've got the all clear now. So I'm just this week now, I'm gonna just need to um, get all the precautions in place. You know, the bit of signage and the hand sanitizer in place and the, the spacing for the distancing for the classes. So yeah, yeah, get in there. Hopefully, get sorted. Probably open next Monday. So um, oh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get down and do a session. Week. I'll get yeah, down definitely. and do a session, yeah, therefore. I need to get fit, that's one thing I'm missing, my training. So, yeah, do you want to bring this week's guest in, mate? Yes, um, another special guest. Um, a mod- I call him a modern great of, um, you know, of rugby league, but more, I call him more a close friend as well, close friend of you know, both of us, Woody. Um, our most capped international player, our former captain at Warrington, the legend himself, Adrian Marley. How are you doing, mate? You all right? I'm all right. Cheers, cheers, Mickey. Not too bad, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on on your your, your, your busy Sunday. Um, yeah, so just, took, said... just took Mrs. Morley out for a, for a Sunday dinner. We've had a, we had a nice Sunday roast and a nice bottle of red wine. So uh, yeah, it was, it was very nice. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody wants to watch this on YouTube and look at his eyes, the <laughs> the, the, the shot. <laughs> the wife drank four fifths of the bottle. I only had a little. little <laughs> Are you what I miss most about lockdown? I've not miss going out, getting on the drink. I miss going out for meals, you know, with the missus and the mm. family and that. So uh, since lockdown finished, we've been out every Sunday now, which is our little little thing. So uh, all good. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's that's. Do you know what? That's one thing. Obviously, I, I don't drink, but I, I do miss going out, having food. That's like my, my guilty pleasure, really going out and seeing people so it's, it's, it's funny what you miss isn't it when it's it's taken away and take for granted are you still furloughed as well Moz? I am yeah so I've not done a, done a great deal for a, for a few months but when the weather was lovely it was great you know spending time with the kids etc as soon as the weather turns bad it's, it's a nightmare isn't it and you think you know in your head it'd be great to be at home not doing anything and it's not all what it's cracked up to be uh, so I've been climbing the walls and I have started doing one day a week now, which is which is great. I've never been as excited to get back to work. So, been a day a week, and hopefully over the next weeks and months now it'll build up, and now we'll get back to a bit, bit of normality. But I think in September when the kids are back in school, that's when it'll feel a bit more normal, you know, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more like uh, real life. I know it's just like, it's just getting. Open the kids are getting back to school next summer. All these have popped up now, so it's another <laughs> at least another six week at home with the kids. So hopefully, exactly. we can, hopefully, I say things are getting back to them. We can go out and start doing a few bits, can't with the kids and stuff. Yeah. So exactly, rugby well, starts well, soon as well. Rugby starts soon as well. That'll make a, a big difference as well. I've been watching NRL, which has been great. It's it's scratched the itch, but you want the Super League back, don't mm. you? So uh, yeah, a couple of weeks that'll be back, and then. Uh, as I say, in September, hopefully, things will be a lot more uh, uh, back to normal. Well, they've just announced in October, haven't they, that crowds can go back to sporting venues. So, 
Yeah. So again, that hopefully, you know, end of September, October, hopefully that will be the. I think everything should be back to normal then, shouldn't it? You know, we're yeah. all we're hoping it's sorted. We're hoping sooner, but yeah, but um, no, it, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Mo- Moza, just starting um, touching on your career. You know, you, you're a Salford lad, born and bred, and um, you ended up. Tell us a little. Well, first of all, tell us about your, your amateur career because probably more more of a football town really, isn't it, than a, than a rugby league town. Yeah, then and, uh, and uh, me, you know, coming from Salford, even though it's got a professional rugby league uh, team, it's Man United mad Salford, and I was no different. I loved Man United. My my dream was to was to play for Man United. I used to play for uh, a football club first, and then when we went to high school, that's when I discovered rugby league. Uh, but as soon as I had my first game of rugby league, that was it. You know, uh, I had a new love in my life, and uh, I joined Eccles. Uh, as an amateur and then uh, it just went from there really we was quite we weren't great you know in terms of when we played against the teams from Wigan and Saints who had like, been playing since they were younger than us we got a good idea but then got better and better as the years went on and uh, ended up signing professional but from, from my team at Eccles uh, five of us signed professionally uh, mm. you know which was a great stat uh, Nathan McAvoy was a member of the team Carlo Napolitano uh, Dave Radcliffe, uh, Ian Watson, the, the current uh, Salford coach. So we, we did have a, a great team towards the end. So it was under 16s and I had to have another year amateur under 18s. But un, under 18s, that's when all the all the best players had signed. And then suddenly our Eccles team were the daddies. And uh, that's that's when we all got signed because we won the league and the, the Lancashire Cup and, uh, and all that. So our fathers who signed... Four went to Salford's and I went to Leeds. About the five of us, I was the biggest Salford fan. I used to live around the corner from the Willows. I was a diehard, you know, I worked as I for Salford. That, that would have been my, uh, my my dream. But they didn't come in for me, unfortunately. But it's not a bad second prize, you know, getting signed for, for, for Leeds, who were, uh, apart from the great Wigan side, they were, you know, the, the second best team in the land. So that's... Uh, mm. You know, so that was, that's how I got the opportunity to, to sign for Leeds. Do you know what? You just answered my first question. I was, I was just going to ask you, what, why did you not... I was going to say, why did you not choose Salford? Because I assumed that Salford would have come in for you, you know. But no, just... no, uh, at this point, I had an offer from, from Lee and an offer from Swinton. And uh, I was just delighted to get a professional contract offer, you know. And I thought, if I don't get an offer from Salford at the end of the year, I'm going to sign for Swinton or Lee. Uh, but then we made the Lancashire Cup final uh, and it was at the Willows. It was against a black brook from St. Helens and I thought, right, now's my chance to show Salford what I've got. Played the game, I played well. Uh, but the lead scout came up to us and said, we come looking at McAvoy today, Adrian, but we like what we see with you. We want to talk about signing. And, you know, as soon as Lee said that, it was, uh, you know, I didn't think I was... You know, I thought, you know, the, the Leeds and the Swintons was about my level. But when Leeds come in, it was, uh, it was a no-brainer, really. You know, the deal was done within, uh, within, within a couple of days. That's how, that's how I signed for Leeds. Mm-hmm. Pretty much uh, mirrors my own experience, that was, really. Uh, start, only started playing in high school. And then, uh, same here, I played a year in the under-18s before I signed for Warrington. And... Uh, it's, it, 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 I like talking about this because um, like we're, we're being involved in the amateur game now as well and, and I see my young lad play as your lad does as well and um, see, speaking to a lot of coaches at the, the, the club where I'm coaching at Ashton Burrs um, you can get a lot of permits and they get quite panicky when the, the son or you, you know or the daughter's not showing any promise at the age yeah. of 13 or 14 and Sometimes it, you know, I have to tell them just, just chill out. They've got so much time. It's all about enjoyment, isn't it? And you know, just because your kid's not signed up or even not, even not playing rugby before he gets to high school, doesn't mean he can't be a professional rugby league player. No, no, you're right, and that's a great point, that would be. Uh, yeah, so just because you've not signed at schoolboy level doesn't mean you've missed the boat. And uh, Jamie Peacock's a great example of that. He was a late developer as I was, and. Uh, you know, I don't think he signed professional until he was about 19. And then even when he was in the professional ranks, it took him a, a year or two to, to, to crack first team. So people mature and, you know, excel at different levels. So uh, 
just because your lad's not made it at that particular point, just uh, don't get too down our head. But I was talking to Jordan James. No, he uh, when, when he got my lad's haircut at Jordan James's barber's. I won't tell you what the what what, it, what he charged me, but uh, <laughs> twenty quid ahead for a four year old and a twelve year old. But anyway, anyway, oh. uh, but I got to join, and I didn't realise his uh, you know progression to rugby league. He didn't play rugby league as a as a, as a kid. Uh, he went to the Marines, played in the Marines, and mm. that's when he you know thought I love this game. I'm pretty good at it, and he didn't he didn't sign pro till he was twenty four. But you know, someone who had a great professional career. You know, imagine he had a lot of the core skills before he went in the Marines and started playing as a, as, as a junior. You know, he, his career could have been could have been huge, but again, he didn't start playing till he was 22, 23 and still earned some money out of the game. So, people, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what, what what age you are when you when you find the sport, it's never too late. It's, I think it's a real sorry, Woody. It's a really it's a really strong message, that isn't it? You know, for like. People and maybe mum parents who get a bit frustrated. Well, why does my lad not do? Because I remember when I, I, I was playing rugby since I was seven years old, and I remember like all my mates around me, pretty similar. They're all signing for like Warrington, Saints, Wigan. weren't very big, weren't very big. Oh, I'm still not very big now, like. But um, you know, it, it was it, years ago. It was always like the bigger lads. You kind of get signed. You know, he's. I mean, I, I got some wise words off my dad. He just said, "Listen, just keep enjoying playing rugby. Just do what you do. Have some fun and." Yeah. You never know what might happen later down the track. And I, I kind of probably did it, I won't say the hard way, but like I signed for Lee, you were in the low division, played academy for Lee in the Alliance a couple of games, and I got my breakthrough, and then I signed professionals from Lee. You know, it, it, we're like, it's, I said a lot, but you now it's flip side because of the scholarships and that. They signed professional early for Wigan and for oh, Warrington's and Saints, and sometimes they, they don't make it. They, they kind of lose it after that, don't they? I think it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that, the scholarship, you know, uh, every, every time I look at it, I think, you know, why wouldn't a player just keep his options open, stay as amateur club, keep his options open, once you're tied into a professional club, you know, don't get me wrong, it's great training, you get all the kit, etc. But 16-year-old, the, the club could say, see you later, whereas, yeah. you know, I've not got to that level yet with my lad, but I might just say, I'm, I'm fine, just... Uh, Mm. Keep it up to open here, but uh, we'll see. That might be a, a decision and a talk later, later on down the line, hopefully. I think, um, I think, like, because we've been involved in the sport as well uh, at a professional level, we probably see it a little bit differently. And uh, it's how can I explain? Like, I don't, I don't push my lad at all because I know that he's got a lot of time. And, and like you've just said there, Mickey, you know, I tell him to enjoy the game. Uh, mm. you know don't put too much pressure on you because I think ultimately if you enjoy it you, you've more chance of playing well and then you've more chance of signing up anyway uh, but again you know going back to what you said earlier, Moz, with, with the scholarship I'm, I'm exactly the same I think it, it can kill the amateur game for me when they've got to 16s if they're not if they're not signed up and they're jacking the rugby in they don't want to go back to their amateur club a lot mm. of the players but um, I think as well the older players that, uh, you know, start playing a little bit older, um, you know, and they get that rejection. I think sometimes having setbacks, it, 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 you know, can, can sort of, um, you know, propel your career to, you know, just push you forward that extra little bit harder. It did with me because I signed a little bit harder, uh, sorry, a bit older. I, I had a point to prove, do you know what I mean? I don't know if you did, Mickey, when you was at Liam Fort. My goal is to get Super League, so it gives you that extra bit of drive. I don't know. Yeah, there was, but for me, it was just I just thought crap. For me, it was like I was playing for my own town club. I didn't expect ever to probably get in Super League. I always dreamt of it, you know, being a kid growing up or watching rugby, love rugby. We were kind of oh, I'm playing for Leeds. And to be funny, at the time it was when I played for the academy, I was like with three or four of my best mates. So it was brilliant. We'd all like get jump pick curb, go training, we'd play. Halifax or Sheffield an away game come back have a few beers we were just just really you know working as well just really happy just being a part of playing for Lee and I think it was only until I got a chance in the first team and Ian Millwall was there at the time and said I'm going to put you in in a cup game and I was like well first team I was like and I think you get it you, get, you know you get a taste for it then for me I think I think that stood, stood me in good stead that I think it really gave me the the impetus to really go and well you know progress now and take this chance with both hands so it's I don't. That's that's how I kind of see it. I know you know it's. 
you know, element to working hard as well when you get your chance. Yeah. There's uh, what did you? How did you find it at Leeds, Moz, when you when you eventually got down to the training ground and uh, you know you were sat with you know with a lot of top players. You know, like you say, apart from Wigan, they were probably the best team in the league, weren't they? Yeah, they were. Well, at first I was a bit uh, a bit intimidated because it, I didn't have much confidence. I was you know dead skinny, and this opportunity to have Leeds come out of the blue, and I was thinking, am I good enough just to sign for a club like like Leeds? Uh, so I obviously went through the ranks uh, played half the year in the academy, but well, then I got an opportunity to play for the for the A team. Now some of the academy boys, when they got an opportunity to play the A team, it was quite a bit daunting, really. But because I had had that year under 18s at Eccles, when I was there playing for the under 18s team, I actually played for the the A team Eccles and the first team Eccles. You know, playing against proper men. So when the Got the chance to play for the A team at Leeds. I weren't as intimidated as some of, some yeah. of my, my teammates were. So that that was that was a great grounding as well. And I only played about five five eighteen games. That's when I got an opportunity. Uh, Doug Lotto came up to us and said, uh, "I'd like to play first team." I was only seventeen, still dead skinny, but uh, once once I played first team and loved it, you know that I thought this is the this is the place to be. But it probably took me about. At least a dozen games for for the uh, for, for me to stop thinking I'm a fraud. They're going to find me out when I get dropped for next week. To thinking, you know what, I'm I'm, I'm doing my bit here. I'm, I'm playing my part. I deserve to be here. So, but it was quite a quite a big moment. You know, no one said anything to me. Or it wasn't any advice, but just in my own head, for some reason, I just thought this is where I I deserve to be. And then. The penny dropped, and I just thought that my performances improved dramatically after that. You know, not being as uh, insecure and, and whatnot, and then it just progressed from there. So, uh, from not being uh, from not being very confident in my ability to, to make it first team at a young age, and then staying in the first team, that the, the rise was 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 rapid, really, and uh, plain sailing after that in the uh, in the first team. Well, well tell us. Sorry, did, did, let no, you, tell no, you. Let, let let Mozza tell us that story about Dougie Lawton, Moz, when uh, <laughs> you made your debut. Tell us about the uh, the inspirational speech that he well, gave you. And... It, it wasn't my debut, it was, it was the game after. So I made my debut on, on Good Friday in the 1994-95 season. It was against Hull at all. Uh, remember it like it was yesterday. And it was actually on TV. You know, they've been showing old games uh, yeah. on TV and, and on... Um, Lee Rhinos TV and actually watched the game. Uh, it was it was fantastic. So that was Good Friday, but then I got, I got asked to play Easter Monday like it is now. Well, they don't do it anymore, do they? Good Friday and Easter Monday, but so I come off the bench on Good Friday, and uh, I was going to start on Easter Monday, and I uh, got to the ground dead nervous and I couldn't see Doug, Doug Lawton anywhere. And but uh, you know, I just thought give us a few words of advice, you know, just to get the nerves down, but no sign of him and then 20 minutes full kickoff still no sign of Dougie and I could see a few of the, the first team boys they were getting a bit nervous as well where is it and he had five minutes full kickoff he come walking in changing rooms with a flag in his mouth he says you'll beat this today because the shit turn around <laughs> <laughs> I just walked out the changing room so I thought alright so that was my uh, introduction to first team but uh, yeah but he was, uh, he was, he was great, Dougie. You know, uh, great for the one-liners and, and stuff like that. But you know, thankful for the opportunity. And that that was another reason why I was delighted to sign for Leeds because at the time, Dougie had a policy of if you if you're good enough, you're old enough. There was uh, Marcus Vasilakopoulos, Francis Cummins, Paul Cook. They they were all playing first team, but my age. So I thought, if uh, you know, if I'm good enough, I prove myself. I'll get a get a chance and. And I did so. Uh, you'll beat these today because this shit. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think I heard uh, Pep Guardiola is it uh, said that before one at Man City. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told Mar I spoke to Martin Afire. Me and Mickey did Martin Afire a few weeks ago, and we, we we actually said about he was talking about Dougie Lawton, saying like you know he was a great coach for him at Witness and. When I told him that story, he said that was sort of Dougie's way. He liked his players being relaxed. Yeah, he didn't like yeah. them being too tensed in the well, changing rooms. You know what? Do you know what? 
technically, you know, as a as a coach, you know, you'd say he was very poor, but as a man manager, it was fantastic. You know, uh, you know, Ellery Allen used to take most of the training sessions, you know, uh, on the field at the technical side, but he was just great. You know, uh, made you feel laid back, and he was just, uh, uh, do, you know, if that that was his his aim to to make you feel relaxed and make you feel. Uh, uh, you know, good about yourself to, to perform well. He, he was uh, he was the number one guy. Yeah. Well, he come. I remember he come back. Um, was it your hundredth, hundred and fifty appearance, Warrington? He come and give you your shirt, didn't he, Dougie? That time when we were <laughs> on Team Rome. Yeah, it was a nice surprise that, wasn't it? It was lovely. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, we're good. Yeah, I said I know Warrington are very good at that, but so that was a yeah. nice touch of you. You know, you one of your first coaches. You know, to give you shirt. Um, yeah, it was. Um, we got. Yeah, it was lovely. So just touch it, I mean, we can just touch on this before we go on to next stage of your career, but in terms of, like, management style, do you think that's a more in, in, important aspect of coaching the more the man management than the technical side? Uh, well, I think, it's a, I think it's a major part. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can't have someone who doesn't know what he's doing, you know, technically. Mm. Uh, but you know, I'll, I'll go back to my... My my favourite coach of my of my playing career was was Graham Murray. Now, don't get me wrong, he was very uh, a very competent coach, and some of the things he did were was great. But off the field, he was, was absolutely great. You know, he, he'd do anything for you, and uh, there was mutual respect there. And I think that's half the battle. If you like a coach, and you know, you want to play well for him, you know, you, you ultimately you will. Whereas if you think your coach is a bit of a knobhead. You, you won't perform for him and uh, he had a great balance of, you know, still being a good coach, don't get me wrong, but just everyone loved him. Everyone loved Mozart and I uh, just thought, uh, you know, that, that's a, a great trait to have all your, all your teammates, all your team, you know, all your team to uh, think the world and that's what we did. So, uh, yeah, you, you can't have, uh, you can't be a, a duffer, you still got to know your stuff, but, you know, to be a, be a great book with it is, uh, yeah, almost. Oh. I don't know what it's like in other sports. I mean, I don't technically. I don't know what you know anything about football. I don't really know anything about rugby union or other sports. But I think from a technical aspect, rugby league, you don't really have to be a, a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon to to sort of know the moves, do you? Because it's quite a simple game, and everybody's doing this very similar tactics at different like Super League. So for me, in rugby league, it is it's a massive aspect of. Of, of, of man management and knowing your players and how to deal with certain players and keep them in check as well, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'd say probably, probably Tony Super is probably the best. You know, some coaches yeah. have got some things, some are good at others. He was probably the best at being very good at virtually virtually everything. So, uh, yeah, you know, you've got, to, uh, you've got to manage the team. You've got to, you know... Get, get 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 the players and you've got to be very good at everything. Tony, Tony was uh, was very good at that, but I agree with Tony there, buddy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, sorry, Mickey. Just why it's on about Tony there as well. It's another question you know you get asked when you go back to amateur clubs. Sometimes you can be looking at skills uh, which are very basic and fundamental, but I have, I said to him, you know, that's that's what Tony sort of based our training on. You know, his man management was exceptional, but then his, his, his training methods were so basic. Some, some of it were like doing under 10s training at times, wasn't it? You know, the static, static passing, yeah. Passes. That was brilliant, wasn't it? I used to go, I was funny when like, somebody used to like, not run past him or just smack it start again. You were he like, it's it. just back to zero. Who used to always get counting wrong? Was it you, wasn't it? <laughs> I told you I can't count past 10 you had to count got for me 68 we just got 69 Whee! <laughs> <laughs> good time Mozza, it? Mozza just uh, well, moving on from your Leeds career because it, it, it's quite surprising really that you said that you was uh, you know not you weren't very confident and you didn't feel like you belonged in the Leeds team and then all of a sudden you, you get an approach five years later for the best competition in the world in the NRL. So it is a bit of a, a drastic change all of a sudden. How did that come about? Well, I toured Australia with Great Britain uh, in, in 99. So I made my debut for, for Great Britain in 96. 
played 97 and then I toured Australia 99. We played the Aussies up in Brisbane. Uh, we got a good hiding, but I played well. And the great Arthur Beatson come up to me in the, in the players' bar and he was with Nick Politis, the owner of the Roosters, and said, uh, I thought you played well. We want to talk to you about coming out and, and playing in Australia. But I didn't think too much of it at the time, but about two weeks later, Graham Murray actually got the head coaching job there at the Roosters. And that's when I thought, well, if I was going to go down under, it would be with Graham Murray who worked with and you know, think the world of. Uh, and that's when we got talking. I had another year of my contract to go at Leeds. But then when I come back halfway through 2000, that's when I made the decision to, uh, to sign for, for the following year. But I was only 23 at the time, which, you know, I always wanted to go, but probably... Probably thought I'd go later on in my career rather than 23. But then uh, I just thought, yeah, I'm going to give it a crack and, and see how we go. And uh, loved it, never never looked back. Yeah, I'm just going to say, you, when you speak to us about it, you, you love your time out there, didn't you? You know, um, yeah. I think yeah. you try you try and go back whenever you can. I know you don't you don't like spending too much of your money on them flights and accommodation. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I know, just give me a little bit of insight into, you know, what it was like over there. You know, it's just, I think people yeah. think that the Aussies are they're so much better than us and that, but you know, people like yourself go out there and you know, you you you've got legend status over there as well. It's you know, then yeah. it's, I don't just into a bit into well, a, just go into a little bit of that. Well, well first off I didn't realise how big the sport was over there, coming, you know, from the north of England where uh rugby league, you know, nationally it's not not a huge sport. Whereas I went over there and I flew to Sydney Airport at 6.30 in the morning and there was three camera crews there and I just thought there must be a you know, pop star or a film star on the, on the, on the plane. <laughs> and they, the plane. Come, they come walking over, Adrian, uh, great, welcome, can, can you give them an interview? And yeah, so I did the interviews and the, the first week I was there, I probably did about 20 interviews either on the phone or in person. I just thought, wow, it's another level, this sport over here. Because it was, it was big news, you know, I couldn't uh, great bit of play going over, but I absolutely loved it, you know, I loved the, the extra attention and, and uh, the media coverage and that. And I loved playing as well because I'd, 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 uh, I'd created a bit of a uh, reputation for myself, you know, in England in the Super League, but no one really knew me over there, which I thought was great, really. So I then had to prove myself all over again. And, and, the, and the games were uh, so intense over there, you know, Home or away, no matter who you play, you know you, you're in for the for, for the proper game. Like so, I, I love once I got used to it. I loved the the week to week intensity as well. You know, loved the uh, loved the game, but but the lifestyle over there was great. Where where I lived in Kudji Bay, there was a, a beach at the end of the street. So for the first month, I was on the beach every day, and I, I had to realign my head, going, "You're not on all the earmos. You're here to do a job. You're gonna." Have to, uh, <laughs> You know, start, start training and doing a bit now. But to be fair, you know, once I got the first month out of the way, I very rarely went to the beach. It went not until people come over, you know, like visitors to, you know, to, to stay with. That's when I took them out of the beach. So you sort of get used to it. It's a bit, a bit, of, a, bit of a novelty at first. But, but yeah, you know, the weather's great. The lifestyle's great. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great six years of my life. And we also had a bit of success there, which, you know, it wouldn't have been the end of the world if we hadn't, but, you know, it's always nice to have a bit of success. So we, we I went in 2001 and the following year we won the, won the grand final. Now, mm. the, the club had not won the grand final for 27 years. So to be part of that team to, to win the grand final after so long was great. We made two further grand finals without getting the win, but, you know, it's still an achievement to make a grand final without getting the win. And, you know, uh, out of six years to play three grand finals, mm -hmm. uh, it was great to come over in and play in a World Cup challenge against, was it against you, Mick? Yeah. He was, yeah, that, yeah, it was. Yeah. That I, 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 it wasn't I a game, part. it was more of a, I took, more of I an, took an part. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. think, I'll be, I don't think we'd have scored if we're still playing now, honestly, I do, honestly. <laughs> I think, that night I saw a difference in probably the, the standard in the leagues, you know, in, mm. at the time, you know, you kind of, because I think that was my first experience as, you know, playing an Australian team in the World Club Challenge. I think, was it 35 nil? 38 nil. 38 nil. And, you know, I think we, we, we were a bit like, it was both, we played at Bolt at the Reebok Stadium. It was like minus two, I thought. I could see you all with your trackies on. There's only you with your shorts on, I think. And everybody, I thought, <laughs> we were like, oh, we'll get these tonight. But just, 
I think just the intensity that you've played at, that you think you've been used to playing at, because it, I noticed it yeah. like your line speed, we're picking the ball up from dummy earth and you guys are on us, you kick chase mm. for light, so one yeah. with a solid line down, we, we just couldn't, we couldn't find a way through you that night, and it, it, it does, it kind of, and I think like you said, I think it was intensity the week in, week out at the time, in the league, that yeah. I think that was the difference, um, but yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It was, a, it was a pretty crash outside as well, Mickey, you know, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. and you know, <laughs> Brett and, Finch. And, yeah, yeah, Craig Fitzgibbon and, and Fitz, players. Yeah. But, but yeah, that, you did have a good quality too. That was probably my, my favourite game, you know, for, for the Roosters. The fact because we was back in the UK and I was representing the Sydney Roosters in England, we stayed at the Worcester Marriott in Salford where I lived, and all my family was there at Bolton. And uh, the, the full week was ace, you know, showing showing the the, the Rooster boys around the Trafford Centre and. Manchester Town Centre and, uh, yeah. um, and the game was great. You know, we got the win at um, scoring a try as well. He scored, yeah, he scored as well, yeah. It, 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 it was, everything about it was, uh, it was great, pal, yeah. I always remember that game. Uh, it, it was like you said, Mickey, the, the intensity that the Roosters yeah. were in that night, just un- unbelievable. I always remember uh, a couple of weeks later, we went into pre-season and Paul Cullen... Uh, Actually, put, put, he edited that video up and he's saying this is how we need to start defending as a club. Mm. You know, we spoke a few weeks ago, didn't we, to Cole about how he, in, he wanted us to instill that relentlessness, that toughness. And I think at the time, the Roosters certainly were head and shoulders above everybody else. I mean, just talk about this, some of the stuff he did in training, Moz, because some of their training was next level, wasn't it, in terms of the fitness? It was, and I was quite fortunate that uh, I went to a very, very fit club. Like, uh, when I was at Leeds, I was, you know, easily the fittest forward. And, and uh, you know, for some of the sprint drills, they put me with their backs, you know, uh, to, to try and, uh, you know, to try and compete with them. But when I went to the Roosters, there was probably four or five of the, the forwards who were fitter than me. There was uh, Simon Bonetti, there was Craig Fitzgibbon, there was Luke Ricketson. And I remember that my first training session, uh, there was all, you know, miles out of me. I thought, wow, they're, they're a fit bunch, these boys. So, you know, as the weeks and months went on, I ended up, you know, getting, uh, catching catching up to speed with them. But uh, I just remember being such a fit, fit bunch of lads. But, yeah. but there was that, there was that, um, uh, there was that intensity of training, but also competition, you know, uh, who'd, who'd, win, who'd win the fitness drill, who'd be the fastest and all this. So it was, it was great, and that that transfers to the pitch, and you know I'd sprint out the line, put a shot on, and then thirty seconds later, Craig Fitzgibbon would do the same because I'd inspired him and all that. So we had we had that that going on all the time, which was uh, was great. But it was probably about six or seven weeks before the end of the season. There, there was no meeting about it or anything like that, but just our line speed was just just ferocious, and we all enjoyed it. And Ricky Stewart put it on the tape and said, you know, that's great, boys. So we just all looked at each other and said, right. Let's do that. It's a winning formula, and, and throughout the, the end of 2002, that's what we focused on: line speed, and uh, you know it, it, it worked for us. And and that was the first game of the following year, the World Club Challenge. So you got the, the raw end of it. Uh, you know, say as we we had a full off season to you know practice and all this and there, uh, but but the game, you know, the one much in it for 20 minutes, but once we got our nose in the front, it was uh, one way to think one up. I think once I come on, you floodgates open. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I always remember. I always, we did. Re, we did re, um, review on the Monday after it. Neil Millwall said, "Yeah, he, um, said you were really average coming off the bench. You made no impact. No impact whatsoever." Never did everybody. Never did them other sixteen players. It was like, but, yeah, like I said, because me at the time I'd come off the bench, try and spark us up, and literally, I'm. I, I, I'm not kidding when I said it. Literally, to pick the ball and hit our forwards, you were literally tattling on the on our mm. ad line. It was I say it with that yeah. with that intention line well, speed. Yeah. Do you, do you remember how cold it was that night, Mickey? It was uh, it was Valentine's Day it was, and uh, it was freezing. It was because it, yep. Yeah. The final whistle went, and um, there was about five minute break between the final whistle going and doing the doing the doing the presentation, and uh, you could see some of the. Aussie boys, the, the lips were going blue. I was <laughs> on the spot, you know, I don't know how to keep, keep, keep warm in that situation. But 
as soon as we got around the changing room, they, they, they walked in the showers with the full kit on just to, just to get warm. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was bitter, wasn't it? But, uh, yeah, it, it was great. Well. But, well, but the boys flew home the day after on the Saturday. But I told a little porky pie to Ricky Stewart, I said, oh, me, 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 me nephew's getting christened on the Sunday. Can I have another couple of days? He knew he was lying. He just said, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we got the win, you, got the, you, saw, you, you can come home on Monday. So I had another couple of days with the family there. Uh, yeah, on the drink with the rolling and that, so all good. At Get a Tax Rebate, we make it easy for you or your business to claim back thousands of pounds in tax. Most people, like Jane and Philip, don't realise that they are owed money from HMRC, so they never claim. All you need to do is fill out a simple form on our website and we'll do the rest. It's that simple. We've also helped business owners claim back millions of pounds in research and development R&D tax credits. So if you're working in a business or own one, contact us today to see if we can help you claim back tax and improve your cash flow. Get a tax rebate, your tax refund concierge. Eighteen ninety five sports on state of mind. The ultimate lineup. Mason Vienna Aesthetics based in Wigan. For all your wrinkle treatments, dermal fillers, lip enhancement, energy boost injections, immune boost injections. Please visit us on Facebook or Instagram at Mason Vienna Aesthetics. CDX Security, proudly supporting Rugby League. It's uh, just you'll, you'll never. Sorry, Mickey. I'm just touching on that defence then, where you said I just picked up on you said you was enjoying defence. You know your line speed was enjoying it, and no one will ever convince me any different with Rugby League. If if you want to be a, a a good side and win things, you've got to enjoy defence. I mean, I think we had that at Warrington. You know, Tony yeah. used to say you've got to enjoy defence. You've got to, you've got to celebrate uh, a try saving tackle or throwing somebody in touch, holding them up over the line, like you scored a try. You know, and I think it's a massive, a massive uh, common denominator within successful teams. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. Yeah, I agree. And I just think on that as well. I think uh, when we had a real good, strong period from set 2010 to 2012-13. I remember Tony was just saying, like, if you defend, we got, I thought we got comfortable at defending back to the back sets at Warrington. It never, yeah. it never troubled us, did it? Even if, like, yeah. we charged, because we, we were massive on charging kicks down, zero tattler again, and we just defended the set. And I think one game stuck out, I can't think it might have been Usfield. They had about, I remember Tony saying, did they have like 28 play the balls in our line? And we, mm. I think we defended them all. We got the ball and went to the field and scored. And it, to mm. me, it just breaks teams that, doesn't it? When a team's yeah. like that with that mentality, you, you know, I've, I've played, you know, when we played you that night, I knew that like we ain't going to win this tonight. And I think mm. that's where we had them. We, uh, it's um, I don't know. It's just a massive. It's a real like mentality. You know that that willing to defend, isn't it? You know, I think if you're willing to defend for each other, yeah. I think the rest mm. takes care of itself, doesn't it? Yeah. Just in 2005, Moz, uh, Warrington, we we got Joey. We signed Joey over for for a couple of games, and. Uh, we thought we was going to win the grand final. We'd brought over the world's best player at the time in the, from the NRL. And uh, all of a sudden, they announced Adrian Morley as signed for Bradford Bulls Bradford. to help kickstart kick them to, to win their grand final. Just tell us a little bit more about that and how it come about. Well, it, it was because because Andrew Jones, you know, uh, signed for Warrington. It was all a big, big story and, and quite rightly so. Uh, the Roosters weren't going to make the playoffs that year and I got a phone call off Brian Noble who was the current Great Britain coach and he, he just said would I uh, come back to, to play for, for Bradford uh, I weren't too keen at first but he said you know it's a good way to keep fit for the, for the test series and you've got a chance of, of winning something and so uh, I just thought you know when he put it like that why not but I did phone Leeds actually because you know I still felt affiliated with Leeds and 
got it with the enemy, so I phoned Gary Etherington at Leeds and said, Gary, I've had this opportunity. But Gary being Gary, very tight and shrewd, said, oh, no, we just can't, can't afford, you know, we can't give you any money and, you know, you'll have to get your own flight and all this. So I just said, right, I'm going to, I'm going to sign for Bradford. And so I did do, I, I, it was actually on TV the other day, uh, that, that game, Woody, uh, Leeds v. Uh, Warrington, Joey's first game. That was my first experience with the... Uh, Hello Jones Stadium. I went to that game. I'd only been mm. in the country two days. Went to that game. I was just amazed at the atmosphere and you know, uh, and, and the game. You know, all the uh, uh, all the atmosphere generated, and that that planted a seed really to to uh, you know, ultimately one day. You know, that 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 had a big factor in me going to Warrington. But I watched that game, and he, he was absolutely unbelievable, uh, Joey. And then uh, I played on the Sunday for Bradford, and I was quite average, really. So he put the pressure on me. But, uh, but, but yeah, it, you know, it was great. And you know, after that game, you you would have thought they've got a great chance here now, Warrington, to uh, to go all the way. But mm. you know, the, the, we know that didn't happen. But you know, when I, when I did go to Bradford, they they were on a bit of a roll themselves. You know, so it wasn't I didn't single handedly uh, take that Bradford team. So. Uh, you know, they the won a few games as, before I got there, so they was on a bit of a roll themselves. And then, you know, I played six games there, and the last one being the grand final against Leeds. And uh, it was great. You know, I, I wouldn't change the experience, and I'm so uh, grateful to the Bradford club. But of all the things I've won, that's probably uh, my, my least favourite, only because I've not been with the boys all year. You know, I'd not sweat and toil with them, and. Uh, Mm. You know, just coming in at the end, I felt a bit like, uh, like uh, you know, an imposter, really. But uh, as I say, I've still, still got the ring, and uh, yeah, that, that's uh, end the story. Well, it is a good. I mean, it, it's funny you said that, really, because I weren't expecting you to say that because um, it, it was a big achievement at the time because you, the, you became the first Englishman to win an Australian grand final and uh, an English grand final, so. Massive yeah. achievement, so for you to say that, you know, but I, I completely get what you're saying. You yeah, know, not to yeah. not to be with the lads all year and then, you know, yeah. come in, take someone's position and their money, you know, I'd feel pretty bad as well. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, yeah. They're, they're, they're the things what do go through your mind, you know, we're all professionals, we're all men, we've all got feelings and, you know, one mm. of their players did miss out on playing in a, in a, in a grand final. Uh, but would I change it? No, I, I, I would. I would still would make the same decision. But it still mm. feels a little bit hollow that 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 victory. But you know, if, if it wouldn't have been for that opportunity, I wouldn't have become the the first Englishman to win a grand final on both sides of the world. So uh, glad it happened. But as I say, it's not uh, not my proudest not my proudest victory. No. Mm. So just just moving on from that, Moz. Obviously, you, you played. You went back to Australia. You had another season at Roosters then. You made um, what's a quite a big decision to come back home. You know, I think because you were you were still going well in the NRL, and I believe at the time I was I was when you signed for Warrington, I was at Wigan at the time, and I believe we all got told you were coming to Wigan. We were kind of, yeah. and I, I know you you can tell the story, and I know a bit about it because I've spoken to you. But we were, I think we obviously we just got Stuart Field in the year before. We 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 had a terrible 2006 in at Wigan. You no know, injuries crippled us. We lost our coach. Brian Noble came in to be fair and you know made a couple of shrewd signings. We did really well back end. But you know we got we got talk in 2007 that you you were coming. You know like potentially fielding at the time yourself two, the two international props. Yeah, I thought it was an um, exciting time for Wigan, and we had Trent Barrett yeah. coming as well. It was um, just 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 tell us a little bit about that, mate. Yeah, well, well, it was yeah, 2006 and uh, I was still enjoying my time at the Roosters and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, fell pregnant with our first child. So that's when we both thought, made a decision, you know, it'd be nice to go home and have the grandparents around with us, etc. So I told my manager I wanted to go back to Super League and um, Wigan and Warrington, they were the only two clubs who, who rang me and said, I want you to come here. Now, uh, you know, Wigan and Warrington, um, very similar deals. So it was a you know decision time. But I go back to when I, when I, my first experience with the Elmo Jones. You know, I just thought, you know, if 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 home home, home games are like that every every uh, every time, you know, it'd be a, be a great experience. And uh, you know, Warrington's the next town along from from Salford as well, so I could get to live in my hometown. 
And I was just really impressed with um, Paul Cullen. Paul Cullen was actually out during the year with uh, Mike Forshaw. Uh, they was on a scouting mission and I, I got on well with Forsh, you know, ex-teammate and got on great with Cull. And I just thought it'd be, it'd be a great club to go, you know, because Wigan, you know, they, they were and are a dominant team in, in, in Super League, whereas Warrington were not quite there yet. And I thought it'd be great to be part of that, that, that uh, them stepping stones and that... Uh, you know, you know, trying to get to that level. So uh, that's that was me, me, me thoughts, and uh, that's how I, I was signed for uh, for Warrington. Yeah, right. So um, it was um, what was it now? I remember one of your games you played? I think you to Middle Mall this year. I remember it was my. I think it was a home game. It was early. I think it was early in the season. I think you. You fractured your cheekbone, didn't you? Coming out, that, flying that, out of the line, try and smash them. Um, that was my very, my very first game, Mickey. Was that, that was, yeah, 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 I, yeah, I thought, I thought it worked a bit. Yeah. Well, well, do you know what? It was great because um, it was my first game and uh, it was on Sky, you know, against Wigan, you know, the, the, the big uh, giant of, of our sport. And I just thought, right, I'm going to show the British public what they've been missing for the last six years. I'm... Uh, I'm going to fly out the line and give someone a Molly special. And I weighed up the forwards, and it was even old Carroll. I thought he's not, yeah, not the biggest. So I thought, right. Big head, though. He's got a big head. He's got a big hard head, yeah. So he's going to get a Molly special, flat the line, and head clash and, and broke my cheekbone. And uh, yeah. but, but my comeback game, I missed about seven weeks. And uh, my comeback game, I re broke the same, the same eye. <laughs> so then I missed another seven or eight weeks, and I just thought, it's not going as well as I would have liked this return to Super League. <laughs> it's, uh, but, uh, there's a couple of games, you know, later on in that that season. I was I was quite pleased with, but as a whole, having missed, you know, three months or however long it was, uh, wasn't 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 one of me uh, one one of the better seasons. I remember I remember that Wigan game when you kept. I was actually stood next to him as you come flying out at line and aim and. Him and he, to be fair, he's a, he was a tank, him and one he very hard to put a shot on, stocky yeah. lad. Uh, yeah. You come off second best there, and then like you say, you was injured, and then I remember you coming back on your comeback and you're doing it again, and it was it was absolutely devastated for you. Uh, <laughs> but you did, even though I know you're saying it didn't go as well as you as you like, but I think you don't realise the impact that you had, even though you weren't playing. It was like you could see that you brought a lot of good things towards the club. Uh, the training, I always remember, and I, I still do it now, even in the gym now when I'm training, don't put my hands on my hips when I'm tired. Body yeah. language, those little things that, that you brought in help yeah. to change the culture and the, dyna- the yeah. dynamics at Warrington. And they're only little things, but for me, they, go, they make a they, big difference. They go a long way, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, you know, I've always, you know, prided myself on being an art trainer and, you know, honest and I try to bring bring a bit of that to, to, to Warrington and uh, it took a you know a year or two to to for everyone to, to, to get on board, but I'd like to think uh, made a made a bit of a difference there, yeah. Cheers. Well, well on it, that on that though, Moz, I was just gonna say sorry, Mickey, uh, when I when I went to Lee and I was on the coaching staff and I was a strength and conditioning coach there, all the players hated me for it. And they kept saying, what the fuck's this got to do with rugby? And I said, but these little things, this body language during games, when you've done, say, three or four sets back to back, and you're just walking around and you've not got your hands on your hips looking tired, it gives out these messages to your opposition and it generally does work, doesn't it? You know, when we see opposition doing these back-to-back sets, and they don't look, well, you know, they, are, they are tired, but they're just not showing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's what, you know, you can be... Absolutely knackered, but as long as you're not showing it, because you know, if a smart halfback looks up and says, "Look, he's doing a teapot there, he's doing the uh, the other <laughs> there, sugar bowl, you said, sugar bowl, oh, and then uh, all the Chinese yeah, tourists, oh, oh, he's <laughs> taking <laughs> photos." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, just obviously but, after a few seats. Sorry, would it? Um, no, go on. Obviously, I, I think them traits that you you instilled at Warrington, you know, your professionalism and how you train. Obviously, it got you the it got you the captaincy, didn't it? What what year did you get the captains, Tim? Uh, what was two, it? Two thousand and eight. And eight, well, yeah. So did, no, was, was it not? Was it two thousand and eight? Was that you become? Did you not get it straight to work? No, no. I did a year, uh, two thousand and seven under Breezy was captain, and then it Cole asked me to be captain in two thousand and eight. Because you had quite a big impact. Uh, 
and straight away as you was made captain, you had a big impact, didn't you, on a pre-season <laughs> trip in Lanzarote? <laughs> if you just want to, if you just want to elaborate on that, <laughs> I did, mate. So I, I'd been made captain the week before at Paul Cullen, <laughs> and uh, you know, you know, the captaincy was once something I took lightly. You know, I, I'll be, I'll be honest. You know, early on in my career, I don't think I was captain material, but. At this stage now, I was, you know, a lot mature and a lot wiser and, and uh, I actually give it a lot of thought and I thought, you know, I don't want to put my name to do something that I don't think I'm going to, you know, uh, do it justice. And uh, Having thought heavily, I thought, yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to, uh, you know, be as professional as I can. So I thought, yes, Cole, I'll, I'll take the captain, say I'm very proud. Thanks very much. And the following week, we went to um, La Santa in, in Lanzarote for a... Uh, uh, usual pre-season uh, training week and then you know you train hard all week and now I was at the front you know uh, trying to lead by example and then we had the night out which is great for, for team bonding and uh, and anyhow the, the year before I didn't go out you know because that's how I thought I don't want people to think I'm here for a holiday I want to know I'm professional but then having been made captain I thought yeah you know I still should socialise with the boys go out and we all went out and we all we all tied one on, and we all got a bit bit too drunk than we uh, than we should have. And then uh, then the game started, and then uh, I think it was Starsky and Hutch or some daft cop game, and I did the monkey roll over the car. Didn't think anything of it at the time, but then uh, being heavy than uh, I thought, I wanted did a bit of damage to this car. Then the, <laughs> the, some police come over. What's going on? And then it, it was like a scene from. Uh, Cops and robbers then, all, all the rugby lads were running everywhere, all the police were chasing and then, you know, it was a bit, it was a bit fun at first, but then it got a bit serious for if these coppers get on us, they give us a good idea and then, uh, anyhow, we all then were going back to the, uh, back to the digs and then um, the, the following morning, uh, Cole got me and a few of the senior boys, uh, Mick Monaghan and John Clark and uh, he said, guys, it's a bit serious now, uh, Lagarde are on the way. Uh, someone's uh, damaged uh, a car in, in, the, in the town and they said, I know it's only you boys, but we need to know who it was. And I had to say, actually, Cole, it, it was me. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the look he gave me, and he went, well, I can't say I'm not disappointed, Boz, uh, but uh, it's supposed to be the captain here. But uh, well, I was absolutely gutted. You know, I've been only been captain a week to, 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 to let, let, the, let the coach out of that, but... But they, they did take it too seriously. They sent a cop to the uh, to the hotel, as you know, and they, they, they nicked me. They took me down to the uh, police station. I had to have a night in the uh, in the cells, and uh, <laughs> oh, it was horrific. But I've never been never been as pleased to see Paul Cullen the next day when it when he come with Jimmy Lowe's and uh, I, I, I got out and I just, I just gave him a cuddle like that, you know, because I had uh, twenty four hours thinking of me own. So. Uh, <laughs> well, that was uh, a great start to me captaincy, but I'd like to think after that, once we got that out of the way, I uh, <laughs> led by example. And I was just telling Mickey earlier that, you know, before we come on, and I said, it, you know, we can laugh about it now, but at the time it was pretty serious because these, these Bugada came, took Mosra away, we knew he was in a cell, and we carried on training as though everything was, you know, just carry on as normal. And then we got, you know, the message just before, an hour before training, Luke, we all need to throw in 100 euros with a bond on Mozzie's head. We need to give like $3,000 or whatever it is. So we all give 100 euros in, give them to the coaches. And they said, right, we're going picking him up now. He'll be here halfway through the session. So the lads thought it would be a great idea to get this T-shirt designed with arrows on. So when he come training, he had to put the T-shirt on with the arrows on. <laughs> Go on, what's that? Bastards. <laughs> I know, though, Mozart, do you know what, though? It's a great example of a story that, you know what, as a legend you are, and, you know, you've got a lot of respect in, in rugby and, you know, being mate captain. You know, we're all human beings, and at the end of the yeah. day, we make mistakes. And I know personally, you know, being involved with you at that time in your career, how disappointed you was as, as a player and, how you, you know, how you wanted to put it right. So, yeah. you know, you, you, do, you do have very high standards of yourself. Yeah, no, you're right, and uh, yeah, I was absolutely shattered, and uh, I made sure I addressed the boys, apologised, and uh, thanked them for the money for, for for bailing me out, and I did pay everyone back, Woody. You'll you'll vouch for that, but I was shattered. You know, it did take me uh, well, it 
took, took me a good uh, a long while to get over it. But as I say, I'd like to think, uh, you know, put it under, put it, put it to bed, and uh, um, you know, uh, really um, made amends. Moving on from moving on from that period, obviously, Cole ended up leaving at that point. Uh, well, a few months later, Jimmy Laws comes in, and then you know. Tony Smith come, comes to Warrington and, and takes over from Jimmy, and again we see we see a transition, don't we? Yeah, we do. I mean, cool, fantastic coach, cool, uh, you know, and a great bloke. Uh, you know, I uh, I was really um, really sad, you know, not, to see cool not there at the at the helm when we we had the, the success we did. Mm. Uh, but you know, the, the, the powers that be. So it fit to, to, to bring someone else in. So, uh, but Tony Smith, you know, wherever he went, he, he had success uh, at Huddersfield, albeit not winning things, but you know, making them uh, um, competitive. Uh, Leeds had, had the winning winning the couple of grand finals there at Leeds. Uh, so he, he, had, he did have this uh, grounding, and uh, you know, what what we know about Tony Smith is a strict disciplinarian. And um, you know, I think it's it's what the what the Warrington club needed at that time. And uh, under Tony, it was just uh, you know our, our Super League form was still poor, really, in, in two thousand nine. But it was just the cup run. You know, we just kept winning and winning the cup, and uh, we went all the way. And uh, we won the cup. Uh, Warrington had not won the cup for thirty five years, and again to be part of that team who not won it for so long was great. But well, I think it was winning that cup really. What what was the uh, uh, what was the green light then for for the Warrington club to you know to think the shackles are off now? We, we're not the uh, we're not the bridesmaids anymore. We are we are contenders. And then uh, you know from then on it was uh, another, another cup. You know grand finals and, and uh, league leader shields and that kind of thing. So they went virtually overnight from being uh, pretenders to um, uh, you know. Winners. Yeah, we, we we were saying a few weeks ago, weren't we, Mickey? You know, like how important Cole was really for that transition. You know, he built a lot of the foundations uh, within the. Uh, you know, Jimmy took over, didn't go go to plan how Jimmy did, and then I think Tony just came in and basically just shocked us, didn't he? Really, uh, with his discipline and his his man management, and you know, touched on it with Cole, you know, he dropped Breezy to the bench versus London and then Merton Gleeson got shipped out and it were like two of our biggest players and all of a sudden everybody gets a bit of a wake-up call and it's like, shit, Tony's serious, you know, if we want to play at Warrington and, he, and he's, and he's going to deliver what he's saying that he's, he's going to deliver because he kept saying, you know, success will come here, I will bring success, whether you're part of it or not is a different matter. Uh, and then it, I, I think he just came in at the right time, really. I mean, it, timing was was everything. Tony's a great coach, great man management, but I think the timing was was superb for him to to take us over and then take us to that next level, really. Mm. It was. Um, I, it's funny that because a lot of people when they speak to they always say like, "What what did he change?" Like Tony Smith, and he, like you said, we just touched on earlier. He didn't change too many things, did he? He didn't yeah. like. He didn't have these fancy players and this system were like, you know, defensive system where it was just, he just, he just kind of instilled that discipline. That for me, it was, he put the pressure on me to perform every week. You know, he kind of, he just, he had a, he had a nice knacker like, thinking you're going all right, but you, knew, but you think you've had a storm of a game. He said, no, you're all right. You know, like, just, for example, and you're like, mm. wow, you know, I, I think maybe that, that was, was just me. to you. That. that was just me though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, yeah. again, and I think with that as well, like so we used to laugh and joke with Tony, and he, he knew that worked for me. We're like, he had to put his arm around you. What else? You know, you were saying you were leaving every year. <laughs> that, that was that was that was a di- that was a difference in it. Well, that again, good man manager as well. Yeah, for me, I don't think you know tactically Tony changed that much, but I think one of the big things was he brought Damien Hughes in, who was a sports psychologist. And for me, Damien was. Pretty much said it how it was. I think a lot of people have used psychologists in the past, but I think he was a little bit more. Um, he, he spoke to us like he used language how we wanted to, to it to be used, and you know how we pushed ourselves, committed ourselves week in week out, how we conducted ourselves to our players, you know, giving positive bids and getting in this positive cycle 
about you know du- during matches. And for me, even the even to the point where he, he mentioned about picking water bottles up, you know, in the gym through training, all those little things, what made a big difference. I thought that was a big turning point for me. I don't know what you guys think. Oh, Damien was great. I mean, uh, all credit to Tony to bring someone of of that caliber in to uh, to work with a professional sports team. He was he uh, was fantastic, Damien. And I like that when he talked about the chimp brains. Because that was a bit of you, that would do, wouldn't it? When uh, fight or flight and all that, it was. Uh, <laughs> well, it, gets, it gets you thinking about about life and about you know why we do the act, why why we why we act the way we do and things like that and uh, fascinating stuff. Mm. Well, that's that's it, isn't it? I mean, ultimately, you know, we're, we're, we're sports people, but we're human beings first. And Tony used to use that expression, didn't he? You know, we're, we're, we're people first, and then we're rugby players. So if we can take care of ourselves as people and we're happy and we're, you know, our life's going well away from, from the rugby pitch, ultimately, we're going to enjoy our rugby more. But then if our lifestyle's shit away from the game, then generally you bring a lot of shit to training and you bring a lot of drama. So it is interesting that. And I, I, don't, I just think whatever you do, it, it, it transcends into to any, any career or, you know, any environment that. Yeah, well, I think I think you use that in your your other skills, like you know, obviously when you you come away from rugby, I think that you know your your mindset and your you know how you apply yourself. I think rugby certainly with your with him and use. I think you take a lot of that stuff and put it into like your you know your other businesses or your other work. I think you know, and why wouldn't you? You know, you've had somebody one of the best in this field. For me, I think that's why a lot of so rugby players, when they go into other works, they, they do do well because I think they've got that work ethic to, to start. You know, they've been in that team environment and the, the little, the little you know, add-ons that we were privileged to get, like a psychologist or, you know, nutritionist or whatever. I really do think it, it stands you in good stead for, you know, later in your, well, your, your working life, so to speak. I think uh, I'll give you an example this week, Mickey, as well. Uh, you know, what I've realised is that you know, when you're in a sporting environment, especially rugby league, you say it how it is. And, you know, if I had a bad game, you know, Mozza would tell me or you'd tell me, but you'd give me the the help and the advice that I needed or the support. Mm. Um, what, I've, what I'm finding is that transition, there's not as, it, it, it doesn't seem to be as much honesty with the team, you know, working within a team. So people seem to be a little bit more tainted and a bit more, you know, reluctant well, to say things because they don't want to work feelings. But well, it's funny you sell out. Sorry, psychological sandwich. Out, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the, the one. one. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what you were like, sir. Maybe when you made your you move to Salford Balls. When I went back to Lee, playing for Lee, I kind of, um, I took, obviously, I took things from Warrington to Lee because obviously I went there with her to a view to help them to be better. And it was just little things like challenging players in training, you know, like to be better, like, that's not good enough, mate. You've you've dropped you've dropped two balls in your last four carries, and like they thought I were having to do it to them, or they thought I was being personal. I said, "Listen, this is not personal. This is because we want to be better as a team and get you know to get to better places." And it would just show that, like sometimes, not nothing against not calling anybody at all. It was just because they probably never had that kind of pressure, and probably the, the squad we had as well at Warrington, you know. the the pressure to perform to keep your place was a big one at Warrington, you know, so for me, yeah. you know, to, you got to play well every week and do the little things right. I just, when I moved on to Lee, I just I noticed the difference that, like, they probably got away with things that weren't always, well, we would not get away with them, basically, at Warrington, you know, it, yeah. and it's, I don't know if, if it was a bit like Salford, you know, it might have been slightly different, that. Mm. Yeah, probably, probably was slightly different, but, yeah, you, you probably, probably kept as honest as, as I could and, you know, try to keep my yeah. teammates as honest as they, they could be yeah. at Warrington and uh, probably didn't have that at any, any, any other club really, but uh, it is a fine line because you, you come across as negative and, you know, having a go with someone, but you're not, you're, ultimately you're trying to make them a better player to make your team mm. a better, better team. So uh, mm. it is a tough one, but you've got to be, a little bit thick skin, but you've just got to take it, you know, positive, uh, take the positives with the negatives and, you know, a lot of it's constructive criticism. Take it, take it on board and, and deal with it and, and use it as, as best you can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, just, um, 
we're just moving on from one. You know, we had we had the success. You know, we had great times there. And obviously, you made the you know your final move back home to your hometown club. You know, to finish you know you finish your glittering career off there. Pretty special to play for your hometown club, isn't it? No matter what, I think where, where, what stage you're at in your career. Oh, hundred percent, Mickey. Uh, you know, wherever I went around the world playing rugby league, I was I was always a Salford lad. I was always a Salford fan. I always wanted to see Salford do well. And I just thought, you know, the career I've had, even though you know I'll be the first to admit, it was probably uh, uh, you know past past my peak, past my best. But I just thought if I don't play for my hometown club. My career would feel a bit incomplete, you know. I wanted to uh, want to represent Salford, and uh, thankfully got the opportunity to, to do that. The, the the plan was to play one year and then go into a, a role off the field. But mm. I, I was playing well, and you know, I enjoyed it. And they asked me to play another year. Then I ended up playing two years there. But and then, uh, but it was great. I mean, I did I did feel we underachieved for the squad we had. We had an absolutely fantastic squad assembled by. Marwan Kukash, you know, I thought we could have done better. You know, to have a bit of success would have been great, but that, that weren't, weren't the case. But it made it no less special for me representing representing Salford. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was great, great times. And, uh, yeah, and then there was a role there, post playing, you know, which is uh, important for, uh, for players to look after themselves uh, when they finish as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And you, you went into coaching after that, Moz, but... We'll just, you know, touching briefly on it, and we spoke about it, but it, it just wasn't for you, was it? That no, was it, was, it, it wasn't for me, and you know, I'm so grateful for the, uh, the opportunity off Leeds and, and Brian Noble, but uh, you know, I was never one of them ones to, to think all oh, the career I'm going to go to coaching. It was never my aspiration to do that. So as I say, I'm glad I tried it, but uh, looking back, I probably. I probably did Leeds a bit of an injustice, really taking the role on, uh, you know, because it, 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 I didn't have a passion for it. But as I say, I wanted to try it. I'm glad I tried it. It wasn't for me. It's not for everyone. And uh, you know, there were certain aspects I did enjoy about it, but certain aspects I didn't. Glad I tried it, but then uh, wasn't for me, and, and, and left coaching and, uh, and left rugby league also. And I tell you what, as well, I think that shows a lot about you as a, your character as well. Because how many people would have just thought, "Well, it's a job," and stuck by it? You know what I mean? And you know that's that's not your mentality, is it? Mm. No, no. If, if you're going to do something, you want to do it to the best of your ability, you know, for for your sake and for your employer's sake. But wasn't for me, as I say. Glad I tried it, but but leaving rugby league was a a bit of a big decision, really. You know, having been involved for twenty twenty two years. Uh, I had a chat with the wife and you know rugby league is great I still love the game dearly but all my weekends were took up my summer holidays and you know couldn't go away and I just thought I've spent enough in this sport I want to I want to I want to I want to get a bit of my life back a bit of my family life back and then I spoke with the wife she said whatever you want to do Adrian I'll support you and uh, having, having flicked flicked out the game doing uh, working in recruitment now but even even doing recruitment for a couple of months, I knew it was the right decision because, you know, my weekends were my own and, um, you know, I was spending a lot more time with the family. And as I say, I still love the game, but I'm glad I'm not involved uh, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. How did you find that transition, Moz? Did you... I know, like you're saying that, because I'm the same, you know, I went into coaching for three years with, with Mickey at Lee and, you know, it just wasn't for me. I just didn't have any passion for it at all. And I just, you know, I wanted to challenge myself some other way. And I'm happy that I came out of the game. But I'll be honest if I said, uh, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I did, there's aspects of it that I struggle with where I still miss certain aspects of the game. So just as an example, uh, I took a job on where I was working in Yorkshire. I was staying in hotels. And uh, every time I went into an hotel, it brought back this like euphoric recall of, of, of a specific game or whether it was going Catalans or Magic Weekend or a Challenge Cup final or when we used to stay in hotels in playoffs. It just used to make me really sad. You know, but I don't know if it was just because I was on my own in this hotel room. It was like Alan Partridge. I was living in a travel lodge. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, I, I, it just used to bring, bring back these memories of flood back and as much as I'd try and forget it I just couldn't you know and I, I, I sort of went into a bit of a like you know this is like I wish I could go back type of mentality do you ever have that? 
Oh, I don't, I don't dwell on the past. You know, I loved, absolutely loved every minute, uh, you know, of my time in rugby league playing. But, you know, father time waits for no man. Uh, we, we, we're, I'm too old now, ultimately, but got a lot of fantastic memories. I'm not one of them who wishes that they were, they were young enough to play again. Great while it lasted, but this is the next uh, phase of my life and, and, and career. But, um I do, I do miss it, you know, Woody, but, you know, there, there, there is times when you think, wow, I wish I was playing again. But when you are playing, you don't realise just how good it is until you finish. No. And then you're in the real world, then you're thinking, wow, it's not all it's cracked up to be this. But uh, having done this recruitment, you know, it's given me confidence that I know that if the product's all right behind me, I can put my name to anything, really, you know, business development mm. and that. So it's given me confidence in the in the working world that I don't need, don't need rugby league. It's great, but rugby league has been great. That's given me this profile that, you know, I can go out and, and get meetings, and, and et cetera. So, uh, but as I say, I still love the game, but, uh, you know, it's not for me being, being involved day to day anymore. Mm. What, what sort of stuff are you doing away from your work as well now, Moss? Cause I know you're doing, you, you like your charity work. You do some stuff with Steve Prescott foundation. You're doing, the walk for Rob, Robbie Burrows. Uh, yeah. What sort of stuff you keep doing, keeping active? Well, I was in Taylor just today, actually, with uh, Steve Prescott's lad Taylor. Mm. Uh, it should have been uh, Wembley yesterday, and oh, yeah. he, he, his plan was to run 50 kilometres every day for seven days, and that's what it took him from St. Helens to Wembley with a Is match that ball. That, that was just today. Eh? Is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, so uh, so we said we're still going to do the challenge. We're still going to do the challenge anyway. Uh, so for seven days, he's run fifty uh, kilometers, uh, yeah. but just just round a cricket pitch. So you can imagine how mind numbing that is. So hundred twenty five yeah. laps he's done every day for seven days, and I went wow. down with him yesterday, and I only ran an hour and a half with him. Uh, well, there's been a lot of ex-players I think Lee Breeze has actually uh, been and ran a bit with him he didn't like running when he was when he was playing but, <laughs> but what, what, what a great achievement so I am an ambassador yeah. for uh, for the Steve Prescott Foundation and uh, our old mate Rob Burrow you know uh, we know the tragic news that he's been diagnosed with uh, motor neuron disease so I'm doing the I'm doing the walk from uh, AJ Bell Stadium Salford to heading the stadium Leeds 47 and a half mile and I'm, I'm aiming to do it the challenge for myself to do it is in under 12 hours. So that's next Sunday. So uh, my feet have been in bits with, with all, the, all, the, all the walking wow. and the training. But confident I'm going to uh, get it smashed. But, uh, but the rugby league community have been great for Rob, you know, rallying around him, doing uh, all the fundraisers for him, and, and quite rightly so. Yeah, I've put my hand up for the, uh, the charity boxing match in Leeds in October. But whether that goes ahead or not, I'm not too sure. Uh, yeah. I hope it does. I think I'm, I'm fighting. In fact, no, I hope it doesn't because I'm fighting William Henry. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, meant to be. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, hopefully that's on because you know I think charity, you know, it plays a big part on it. You know, if you can help people, I'd like to think people would do the same for me if you know I was in that position. I'll always remember when you know we've done a few things together, Moz. We did the Warrington Half Marathon for Steve. Uh, Prescott Foundation and Warrington uh, Foundation and then I always remember that day when you you said would you like to walk from the Alleywell Jones to the Willows and we did that walk and I said yeah, yeah I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll do the walk I think it was about 16 miles was, yeah. and uh, oh wow we was only walking I was in bits for about a week <laughs> that's right yeah I remember that yeah well, uh, well I've got I've got to do that three times Woody uh, on, on, on Sunday so uh yeah, sure you'll smash it. Yeah, you well, don't need luck, mate. You'll, I'm sure you'll do it fine. I think it's a good thing about rugby, isn't it? The, the community, just anybody in any trouble or anything, they all just, everybody just buys in it and mucks in and helps to only. I think it's, mm. I think for me, that's what kind of makes rugby that little bit more special than anything else. I just think the people who are play it, involved, coach, support it, everybody's a, it's a ma massive community. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. It's always good when you, I mean, I went to the Rob Burrows game, we, we went Mickey and yeah. seeing a few people there. It's always good to see like ex-players and you know people involved in rugby. It's, it is always a good occasion, so uh, pull together as one. It is family game, isn't it? 
Yeah. Um, I think that'll do us though, Moz. Uh, good insight yeah, uh, into into your speak to Mickey about about your fee. Uh, he's got all your bank. He's got all your bank details. Uh, so we'll, we'll right, sort that out. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's like I said earlier on, just give us your bank details and I'll I'll withdraw so much out of your bank and we'll, we'll crack on from there. When, <laughs> when do, what, what, what month do them payments go out, Mickey? Is it Julember? Yeah, first, it's the first of Julember, yeah. Um, so all right. You, I'll, um, I'll get your details after, Moz. No worries. <laughs> Thanks My a lot, pleasure. Moz. Appreciate your time, mate. My pleasure, guys. No Thanks, worries. Moz. Been great talking. All right, mate. All the Cheers. best. Take care. Thanks, right, Moz. Thanks again, mate. Cheers, See mate. ya.